Funding for Off 90 is provided in part by the Minnesota Arts and Cultural Heritage Fund and the Citizens of Minnesota. Cruising your way on this episode of Off 90. Come with us as we explore Albert Lee, its history, present, and future. Meet an architectural historian who illustrates buildings of the past. Ride along with a young family as they leave their house in the city and go to the country to explore a farm. It's all just ahead, off 90. Hi, I'm Barbara Keith. Thanks for joining me on this episode of Off 90. No two cities are alike. We took a trip to Albert Lee to see what makes it unique. We learned about the story of Albert Lee, how it came to be where it is now, and what its future holds. We talked to a historian, the mayor, and to a few of the people who live in Albert Lee to get their perspective. Come with us as we explore Albert Lee. Come to Albert Lee, you'll see the beauty and it's the quality of life, the people that make Albert Lee beautiful and a fun place to visit and stay. Albert Lee is a small to medium community in the state of Minnesota, in southern Minnesota. We are right now a community that's going through a change. We're looking at changing ourselves from a strong industrial community over the last 50 years to really a destination city. In 1835, a unit of the U.S. Dragoons came through our area, and a member of that unit was Lieutenant Albert Miller Lee, who was a topographer. He was a surveyor for this group, and he had a great vision and was able to lay out the outlines of what was then he named Fox Lake, which later became known as Albert Lee Lake in his honor and later the town was named after the lake. Agriculture in our area is very big, whether it's corn, soybeans, uh, raising cattle. Um, we certainly have some very large uh, farmers that are still making a living um, doing their work as farmers, and of course, providing corn and soybeans for many different types of operations. As far as other things in our area, we, you know, once were a very big meatpacking city and we no longer are that, however, we have uh, a lot of small industries. Farmstead fire of 2001 was devastating for our community at the time. You think about how many people it employed because it was our largest employer at that time. But what is really um, sort of heartwarming is to know that our community survived. We had these other small companies that helped to expand and retrain people to work in them, and we survived. And you know, not every town can survive after their largest employer goes down like that. And then when they decided not to rebuild, I know a lot of people were really, really nervous about, you know, is Albert Lee gonna survive with the loss of their largest employer? And we bounced back. And you know, and our employment is good and, and the people got to stay in their homes and stay with their families. And I think that says a lot for a community when we pulled together and made that happen.
I think the biggest thing that the City of Elberly is working on right now is improving on what it really has. We're taking the natural resources that we have, whether it be our lakes or our downtown area, and trying to really put the effort into them to make them attractions for people to come and use from outside of our community and from within our community. I think the city of Albert Lee has really seen the lakes as a real gem in their community. I think Albert Lee has also seen the downtown as a real underlies gem in their community. Right now there's a real focus in Albert Lee to take those two, what we feel are gems, and marry them. And with our new project that we're doing in the downtown, really taking the road and redoing all the work in that area and taking our lakes, trying to open them up to each other and really let them capitalize on each other for business and commerce. There's a lot of activities that occur because of the lakes and the beauty. The first thing when I have a, the tourists come in, they say, you have a, the most beautiful town because now we can show them what we have by going around our lakes. And so I think we have a, we have a couple of gems and those are our lakes. The beauty about it is everyone can enjoy, not just the people who live on the lake. This gives everyone a chance to, to go around to walk the lake um, and to have activities on the lake. We have a lot of events, festivals. Uh, one of our summer events is the Wind Down Wednesdays. We have both been involved in Albert Lee ever since we got married. Different people call it a small town. But Don came from Burkhardt in Wisconsin, and I came from Garden City in Minnesota, which were really small towns. So it never has seemed like a small town. It's been like a good average sized town, we think. What they've gotten done, uh, it costs a lot. I think it's going to be good for Albert Lee, but in the process, you know, it's just, just kind of hard to get around and, you know, we can handle that. I think we're really making a lot of advances as far as um, just the community feel to it and just, I think for the short time period that we're having to deal with the construction, I think it's worth it. Well, health initiatives, um, people staying healthy and fit, I mean, I work at a health club, so uh, just uh, keeping that in mind with uh, wellness and just staying fit and, and being healthy is a huge factor in, in our personal life and just in my professional life too. Just activity level here, a lot of people are more excited. We've got some more walking clubs and they're building some new trails and you know just different things I think have got people more excited and aware of being active. Indoors and outdoors so it's just it's great to see that in, in the community of Everly to uh, people coming together and, and knowing that there's a need to watch obesity and, and diabetes and health problems and just to do something about it. We're looking at trying to make our community, Albert Lee, a place people can walk to enjoy, not just drive through. The Vitality Project is an important project to the vitality of our community. It allows people to get out not only and socialize with people, but also look at ways that we can live healthier. And those are one of those ways that we're trying to uh, make Albert Lee 
productive in is walking. And so we've actually adopted the walk around our lake as the Vitality Walk, and people are out there using it every day. Well, I personally think this is the greatest place in the world to be. I think Albert Lee, Minnesota provides the opportunity for families to succeed and also businesses to succeed and really individuals to succeed. And I think that's the biggest creation that we're trying to make here is opportunity for people to succeed in any form of life, whether it be your work life, your personal life, or your social life. I still like Albert Lee and I'd rather live in Albert Lee than any other town around because I, I know it so well and the people are so great. Ken Olson has always enjoyed designing and drawing buildings. He also has an interest in local history. Ken found a way to bring his two interests together by making drawings of buildings from the past. Of particular interest to Ken are the houses built by the more affluent citizens from Rochester's early days. Ken has also channeled his interest into publishing his drawings and books, showcasing some of the architectural history around Rochester. My wife and I uh, just got back from a vacation up on the uh, UP, and we happened to visit a lighthouse up there called Big Bay. And uh, I was kind of taken with the look of it, and I found a postcard of it and brought it home. And uh, what I'm working on now is the uh, pen and ink of that lighthouse. For a typical drawing, it's, it's got to be 20 hours. You know, I've never kept track of the time. It's kind of like fishing, you know, the time you spend doing it doesn't count against your lifespan, right? When I was a kid, I, I loved to draw, and, but I was lousy at it. I never had good eye-hand coordination, probably still don't. When I was 12, somebody gave me a set of drafting tools, and I discovered that I could guide my clumsy fingers with those, and that really is what led me to taken that up as a trade. I've always drawn. I like to uh, make renderings in the old way, the way I was taught, with ink and ink wash of, uh, of buildings. Went away to college and uh, ended up majoring in mathematics and uh, discovered I could make a lot more money designing software than I could designing houses. So I worked for IBM 30 years, but I remained a draftsman during that time. Designed a number of houses here in Rochester and Olmstead County, about two dozen, I think. College Street, it's 4th Street Southwest now, was where the early movers and shakers of Rochester tended to build their homes. So I did a book on that called Old College Street, uh, Historic Heart of Rochester, Minnesota. I used to do walking tours of Pill Hill. Its original name was College Hill. We would take six tours out in one week. Uh, anywhere from 50 to 80 people would show up for each one. And the thing that I loved the most about it was learning anecdotal history from the people who were on the tour. We're at the corner of the Mayo Clinic Foundation House property. And along this wall, uh, facing toward downtown Rochester, in 1856 was a white Greek revival house built by George Head, who was acknowledged as the founder of the city of Rochester. Being a shrewd developer, he put his own house in a very prominent site. And anybody that came into town, either by river or by trail, looked up and saw that monster house sitting up there and that said this is Rochester and this is the place to live. The house remained a ruin until 1914 when Dr. and Mrs. William J. Mayo bought the property here and uh, so all traces of that house in the subsequent construction were lost. Those two guys personify the history of Rochester each in a different era. 
And the book that I did on College Street was built around that whole premise that these two men influenced the history. So I did 33 drawings, original pen and inks for the book to show these buildings that aren't there anymore. Yeah, I have three other books. The one immediately preceding this latest one was a book on the Ellerbee firm and the history of all their houses in Rochester. I did a book on Old Frontenac little village over on the river which is just a veritable time capsule. It's a little New England village from the 1850s just dropped in the middle of Minnesota. And then the first book was on Harold Crawford who happened to be a friend and mentor to me who was a master of the, the Tudor design and that's why he has 60 houses up in that hill. Henry Plummer, a fascinating character, he was actually married to a niece of Will and Charlie Mayo, uh, Daisy Berkman. The Plummer Building downtown, the Mayo Plummer Building is named after him, of course. He bought 85 acres of land on the next hill over, which is called Quarry Hill. And his house is at the summit of Quarry Hill. Now we're in front of the house and you can see the structure as designed by the Ellerby firm. It's a very classic Tudor house. Uh, the stone in this house was quarried here on site. Architecturally, Rochester's far more interesting than people give it credit for. The town itself is very rich in architecture. I've never had any trouble finding something to be interested in. Breakfast on the Farm is a fun family event where people can come to learn about farming and get answers from the people who are involved in the industry. Visitors can start off the day with a hearty breakfast and then enjoy a farm tour, wagon rides, as well as many other educational displays. We tagged along with a family from Austin as they explored what it's like to live on a farm. Ready to go? Okay guys, come on, let's load up. Just like that, Jonah. That's perfect. Where are we going today? Farm. We're going to breakfast on the farm. What do we grow in our backyard? Never. We have a garden where we grow something. So they're excited to be able to go to the farm and see it in a bigger scale. Do you know what comes from cows? What comes from cows? Oh, you're right. We like milk, don't we? A lot of the folks that are coming in from the urban areas are three or four generations disconnected from the farm and this actually shows them what, what it's all about. How do they fill the stuff? How do they fill it? Well, see, do you see it right up there at the top? Well, we felt that this is a really good way to get non-farm people out to the farm and show them what happens out here, the value of farm families. Can we pet him? Mama. Can we pet him? They have a baby. They have a baby. Can I touch it? It creates a experience that they can learn about what happens on the farm. It's a fun experience. We have a lot of uh, 
animals to look at, small animals for kids to a petting zoo and a chance to, to interact with certain kind of animals. Hold it really still. He's not sure. He's thinking. <sighs> okay, he sees Dad and he doesn't want that. Oh! What's that? Did you do that? And it's also a chance for the kids and yourselves to talk to farmers, see what farmers do, how we care for things. Uh, we try to showcase a different kind of farm every year in all aspects of it. See some of our new machinery. It's just, it's like almost going to a fair. And it's just a nice family outing for people that are come from a urban setting, even farm settings. It's just fun for everybody. It's nice to share farm life with your community. We're Jim and Connie Sathry, and we are hosting Morrow County's Breakfast on the Farm, and we live on a farm near Adams, Minnesota. Well, I raise uh, corn and soybeans, 1,500 acres, and we custom feed 4,000 hogs, which would be 12,000 a year. Then I got my boar meat goats that we raise every year to sell for 4-H for kids, and uh, cats and dogs and whatever else strays in. We take a lot of pride in keeping our place clean and neat, and it, it takes a little extra effort, but we don't mind it and we enjoy doing it. Well, the kids certainly are enjoying all of the different farm animals that we have here today, I've noticed. It's been fun to walk around and watch them pet the animals. It's fun to listen to the kids. Some like the baby donkey, some like the rabbits, some like the chicken, some don't like any of them. It's fun to see the kids that come from the city that haven't had this exposure yet to, to see the animals, to see what it's like on the farm. Uh, to see where milk comes from. I went to uh, 70 miles to get some of the animals and 50 miles and arranged other people to bring them in and uh, my kids, hired kids, they, they got friends and they had to go get some animals. I even had one kid that works for me and he's disappointed because he emailed the zoo, he wanted an elephant. And the zoo did the email back and said that we sorry, but we don't let our big animals go out. Well, we start back there. We have Scottish Highland long-haired, long-horned cattle. Then we go to the miniature beef cattle that are 36 to 41 inches high. We got some Holstein calves, uh, yearlings back there. Then we go to the miniature ponies. And we got one there, the, a mom that's gonna have a baby any day now. We were really hoping she'd have a baby today. And then you walk up by the house and you'll get, well, what do we got there? We got ducks. ducks. And we got a miniature donkey that stands two feet tall probably. And she's got a baby that's lighter than a bag of groceries. And we got miniature goats over there that they were actually demonstrating milking. And we got um, rabbits. rabbits. Yeah. We have a kittens over there too. Every kid likes something different. We go through a lot of milk at our house. It's your favorite thing, isn't it, Jude? Jude could probably drink a gallon of milk in two days on his own. So they love milk. So that was kind of fun for us I to see that a cow milk. I only love chocolate. You love chocolate milk, yes. Yeah. So they, they were excited to see that a cow makes six gallons a day. So we might, might need to invest in one. <laughs> I think that they like seeing all the different animals and um, it was fun to learn the different facts about them. So we really got to find out lots of things and see a lot of the animals, which was their favorite part probably. How many stomachs do cows have? Well, we were just talking about that. Three, add one. Four, good job.
The farmers do care about what happens out here. Uh, we care for the land, the livestock. This is important to us that these things do well because it's part of our livelihood and it's part of our legacy too as passing on to future generations. Agriculture is going to get more important because other countries, they have to eat and they don't have the opportunity to grow the crops like we do and they need the food and we need the food and it's all about food. We've enjoyed having the people here and all the, com the comments have really been appreciated. Down the road a couple of years, we wouldn't be opposed to maybe doing it again. You said goodbye to the pigs and the cows and what else? The llamas, yeah. So we had a good time, didn't we? Did we have fun? Yeah. That's all for this episode. Thanks for watching. See you next time. Off 90. Funding for Off 90 is provided in part by the Minnesota Arts and Cultural Heritage Fund and the Citizens of Minnesota.